Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. We're here today for today's Sabbath School lesson, Giving Back with Barbara and Elisa. Oh. And before we begin, we need to have the presence of the Holy Spirit so we can truly learn. Barbara, if you could lead us in prayer. Of course. Our dear Father in heaven, Father, we want to thank you for such a beautiful Sabbath, Lord. Another time when we can come to you, we can lay our cares and our burdens behind us and know that you're in charge, Lord. We pray today as we study this lesson that your Holy Spirit will guide us. That is why you've given us your spirit, Lord, is to teach us in all things and all ways. And so, Lord, we just pray that your spirit will work on each heart and each mind today. That only your words be heard, Lord. And in this most important topic about <clears throat> what we do with our resources, Lord, we want you to impress on each person's heart what that should be. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, giving back. So this week's lesson is about giving back. You like the title for this? We'll get to it in a minute. One may say that, you know, I pay my tithe. I give offering. What else am I giving back? Well, let's start with the three phases of life. The first one is the learning years. And that's the time, the years from birth to our education, literally, before we enter the workforce. When we learn to speak, count, form our characters, hopefully learn about God, and receive an education from kindergarten all the way through college. The next one is the earning years, which we actually studied two weeks ago. Um, that's about when we get a career, our career job, not just a summer job. Um, you get, probably get married by this time, buy a house, <clears throat> raise children, which is the previous one, those learning years. So you're teaching them in that time, juggling all of that financially, and it's quite a feat. And then we reach number three, the returning years, the giving back. These are the years to where the earning years pay off for all that planning. And we call that retirement for most of us. Today's focus on the lesson will be how we live during those years and how we use our assets or resources as well. Simply put, what do we do with our money and how do we use it? And I would say even our time. Mm. Yeah. So that is the title for today. We're going to read the memory verse. Revelation 14, 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, from their deeds, or for their deeds follow with them. And I love what the SDA Bible commentary had on it. There's two ways you could look at this verse. Follow, and when you read the follow with them at the very end. This expression has been interpreted in two ways. One, on the basis of the Greek, it reads literally follow with them. That is to accompany them. Some consider that John here refers to the laying down of the burdens of this life and the continuation of activities in the future world. Activity would, of course, cease during the period between death and resurrection for that time of unconsciousness and inactivity. And there's various Bible verses there. But heaven will be the place of pleasurable activity. And the second part of that is others interpret the clause, their works to follow them as referring to the influence a good man leaves behind when he dies. I'm going to suggest both, but we're going to focus on the second one today. So if we could look at it from viewpoint number one, we see the character of Christ that you have when you do fall asleep and how that character is the only thing you take to heaven and and literally, when he raises you at the second coming, your character will even be better. And for the rest of eternity. Viewpoint number two is, what influence do we have when we pass on? Or even in those latter years. So, Proverbs 22, verses 1 through 2, saying, A good name is to be more desired than great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. The rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. 
So where, whoever you are, whatever status you may have, God is your maker. End of story. So let that sink in for a moment. The Lord has made us. Number two is he's given us the ability to support ourselves. Every gift that we have is truly from him. And number three is everything that we have was made by him. And you can say, well, my computer wasn't, but the raw materials that it was used to make it were. So everything truly comes from him. Rich or poor, whatever, it doesn't matter. Re um, really, because it all belongs to him, whether it's a little or a lot. So in the returning or giving back years, there's three points that we must keep in mind. Number one is our needs for the remainder of our lives, financial independence. Number two is the needs of family members. That's a family legacy. And number three is what is returned to God, your spiritual legacy. Now for number one, do we have enough money to take care of ourselves? To not be a financial burden on others, whether it be children or siblings, that we can live comfortably, not extravagantly, by which I mean that we're not squandering money on lavish, it's all about me lifestyles. Number two, taking care of our family members. Usually this means leaving money or assets to your children. Contributing assets for the family legacy is not a bad thing, but the question arises, how much do you give? All of it? Half? Enough to help them in their earning years? I, come across, I came across an article online, Bill Gates and 15 more rich people who won't leave money to their kids. I found this amazing. They leave them about 1% of their, their wealth. And the most amazing one I found out of this, it was a quote, the rock band Kiss, Gene Simmons, he's a, a bass guitar player. He's only worth about 400 million, not billions. He's quoted as saying, what I want to do is what every bird does in its nest. It forces the kids out to go out there and figure it out for themselves. In terms of an inheritance and stuff, they're going to be taken care of, but they will never be rich off my money. In another interview, he said, because every day, or I think it should be every year, but I didn't want to misquote, they should be forced to get up out of bed and go out and work and make their own way. Sounds like the earning years. If the world knows this, as if the Bible says, if even the Gentiles do these things, what about God's people? And finally, the third thing, leaving a spiritual legacy, returning it to God. Hopefully after our needs and the family's needs are met, there are assets remaining. And if so, there are only two ways in which these assets can be given back to God. We'll start with the last one first, because this is shortest. When we die and we give those remaining assets to the Lord to continue his work on earth. I in other words, I no longer have any need for it, because I can't use it, I'm dead. The family's already getting what they're going to get. And yeah, the rest I'll just give to God. And that's the remainder goes. But the only drawback is you miss the joy of seeing those funds for God go into action. Of seeing what God will do with those funds, bringing people to the Lord and to salvation and eternal life in Christ Jesus. Or, while I'm still living, this is option one, I can give to the Lord and as well and see the wonderful things that God will do with those funds whether it be at Adventist schools or churches, anywhere in the world, literally, water wells in places like Africa, evangelistic meetings, preaching the word of God, prison ministries, etc. You get the idea. Later, hearing the testimonies about these events and how people have come to God, that can be priceless. And that joy you can have before you fall asleep in Christ. Something to think about. And with all the financial decisions, they should all be prayerfully made so that we know that we're doing God's will in every aspect of our life. 
Elisa, can you tell us about Sunday's lesson, The Rich Fool? Absolutely. Um, and, and you make a, a great point in, in your summary there. Um, certainly, you know, if we are believers in God, which, which we are, right? Um, how much better is it for during our lifetime to be able to direct where we want the funds to go than to have them go wherever after we, we, we leave this earth, the living part of this earth, right? So um, this Sunday, it, it, lesson, it talks about the rich fool, and this is a parable that Jesus spoke and um, very important for us today as well. It delves into our motives, our mindset, and intent. And it asks the question, what will we do with the resources God gives us through our lifetime? And how will we use our possessions, our money, and our time? Is it for God's glory, or are we focused on self-gratification? So the, the text here, it centers on Luke 12, 16 to 21. So let's read that together. And it says, And he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and, and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul! You have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So in this story, we find a man who's already been blessed with plenty, the the text says there that he was a rich man, so he, he apparently had extra. And he also appears to be quite industrious and thoughtful about business and his future. So thinking ahead, he says, you know, I've kind of run out of space here and I need more room to store uh, the additional crops that are coming in, so I'm going to just make more room. I'm going to take those down. I'm going to build bigger barns. So he does this. Well, so far, so good. He sounds like a prudent steward of what he has been blessed with. But then the story reveals what is really in this man's heart. In verse 19, he congratulates himself for his wise business sense and says, Look, I have all this abundance stored up. I have need of nothing. Therefore, I am going to live out my days in rest, easy living, entertainment, and just enjoying life. Uh, giving no thought to others. So while this may not be too uncommon in our culture today, the Lord had a sharp rebuke for this type of thinking, and he reminds us that every blessing we have, including our own life, is a gift from God, and it is to him that we owe our time, our possessions, and our energy. So the problem with the rich man in the story and the lesson for us today is not that working hard to put wealth aside for our later years is wrong. In fact, the Bible counsels us to live productively and be a good steward of our possessions. Um, a couple of texts to refer to on that. It, in Exodus 29, the Lord commands, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. And in Proverbs 27:23. It says, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. And in Proverbs 10, 5, he says, He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. So productivity and industriousness, um, that's not the problem. Instead, the problem is in the attitude of this man. His self-centeredness and how he spent that which God had entrusted to him. In Ellen White writes in Christ Object Lessons, this man's aims were no higher than those of the beasts that perish. He lived as if there were no God, no heaven, no future life, as if everything he possessed were his own, and he owed nothing to God or to man. 
The general principle in the Bible is that we work and remain productive as long as we are able. We have a number of examples in the Bible, such as Daniel and John, who were working well into their 80s. So age, as long as we are healthy, should not mean that we stop being productive. Instead, to what extent are we able, we should continue to do good and be a blessing to others. So how should we live towards God, both in our youth and in our old age? In Matthew twenty-two twenty-seven, 27, Jesus says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, we are counseled, Therefore, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So in summary, God is to be the center of our thoughts, our motivation, our desire. We are to live to him and for him always. If our priorities are centered on God in this way, everything we do will become a blessing that is poured out for his glory. Throughout our lifetime and through our elder years, we will remain productive in his service. So we'll go ahead and transition Amen. on here. Amen. Thank okay. you. Barbara, can you tell us about you can't take it with you for Monday? Yeah, the there's, Egyptians there's not thought they could. There's much you can take with you. That's true. There's only one thing. The, the Egyptians thought they did. And I, I'm going to ask you for the answer to that in just a second. Okay. So as, as we know here, there's not a whole lot that that we can take with us. And we know that it is given one, for man once to die and then the judgment. So let's take a look at what the Bible has to say on this topic. We'll start with Psalms 49, 17. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. So when he dies, he carries with him what? Nothing. nothing. But his... Character. character. <clears throat> That's right. So your character is what you really want to be working on for heaven. 1 Timothy 4, 6, uh, actually 1 Timothy 6, 6 and 7 says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. I want to say that again. Godliness with, great con with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we will carry nothing out. How many people today are struggling, looking for contentment in all kinds of ways? And really, the true contentment only comes from God. Psalms 39.11 When with rebukes you correct man for iniquity, you make his beauty melt away like a moth. Surely, Every man is vapor, sila. So that's what we end up being, is basically vapor here. James 4.14 Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And one of my favorites, King Solomon, has this to say. And I can relate to this, and maybe many of you can. Then I hated that all my labor, in which I had toiled under the sun, because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. So he's frustrated, because all his work, <clears throat> he has to leave it to somebody else. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will rule over all my labor in which I toiled and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. Therefore, I turned my heart and despaired of all the labor which I had toiled under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill. Yet he must leave his heritage to a man who, will, who has not labored for it. This also is vanity and great evil. He has strong, strong words to say about this. Uh, verse 22, For what has man for all his labor and for the striving of his heart with which he has toiled under the sun? So what, he's, what we're basically saying here is that life goes quickly, but then we die. And then when you die, 
whatever you have left of your material goods that you've accumulated goes to someone else and you don't know if they're going to use them wisely or if they're going to use them poorly. Yeah, if they're going to manage... Oh. Because <coughs> you don't take it with you. Right, if they're going to manage it well or manage it like a lottery winner. Yeah. So it's, it's left for someone else. And most of us uh, who have worked all of our lives do have some kind of estate that um, they have built over the years. Some people particularly, as, as they have planned well, prepared well, and accumulated wealth, and at the end, that wealth gets to be passed on to who? And this is where we need to take time to consider what do we want to do with this wealth and possessions? Byron was talking about um, some very wealthy people who don't want to leave it to their kids because the, ki the, the kids don't know how to manage it. They get into trouble with all of that. And if we don't make plans, what ends up happening is that the government or the civil uh, laws come into play and it depends on if you have a will or you don't have a will and your money, first of all, they take most of it. Right. And then it goes to uh, whoever else, uh, usually the closest family members get the money. And I can tell you, I have seen more families split up being in healthcare and end of life issues, fights in families that should never be over even small amounts of money. And so it's important to think about that and prepare for what you want. In the simplest terms, we can say that because God is the owner of everything, and this is what Psalms 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. So as we think about this, that <clears throat> we need to decide where our money goes, and the Lord owns it anyway, we need to take him into consideration as we plan for our final days. So it would be logically, logical to conclude this. And so as you're doing your planning, you may want to, to consider what that should look like. And in Thursday's lesson, we're going to talk more about that. But death, as we know it, can come at any time and unexpectedly to, to, anyone, to people, even, even today, especially today. So the book of Ecclesiastes, and this is uh, from Ellen White. Actually, this is from the SDA Bible Commentary, and it's Ellen White's comments. The book of Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon in his old age, after he had fully proved that all the pleasures of the earth is able to give are empty and unsatisfying. He there shows how impossible it is for vanities of the world to meet the longings of the soul. His conclusion is that it is wisdom to enjoy with gratitude the good gifts of God. What a beautiful statement. And to do right, for all our works are brought into judgment. <clears throat> Solomon's autobiography is a, is a mournful one. He gives us the history of his search for happiness. He engaged in intellectual pursuits. He gratified his love for pleasure. He carried out schemes of, comp of, of commercial enterprise. He was surrounded by the fascinating splendor of court life and all that the carnal heart could desire at his command. Yet he sums up his, his experience in this sad record, and we see that um, as we read Ecclesiastes. But Solomon had great learning, but his wisdom was foolishness, for he did not know how to stand in moral independence free from sin. In the strength of a character molded after the divine similitude, Solomon has told us that such result of his research, his painstaking efforts, and his persevering iniquity, he pronounced his wisdom vanity. All vanity. And that, that's, it's so interesting because King David left him quite um, a large legacy. Oh, then God prospered him even so much more, and yet, yet he to lost no avail. It all. Yeah. So. He lost his soul somewhere along the way and had to find it again. You know, I read in Ellen White once upon a time um, in a previous Sabbath school, 
Solomon had a plan to marry all these wives and he was going to convert them to the God of Israel and then they were going to be messengers. The only problem was it was Solomon's plan and not God's plan. Well, and that's not what happened. They converted him. He exactly. Didn't convert them. And so, and when it's not God's plan, it usually fails. <laughs> Which brings us to Tuesday. <laughs> Begin with personal needs. So there's a phrase that comes to mind, you've heard. You can't help others until you help yourself. If you barely have the means to help yourself, how could you help anyone else? And how could we help ourselves by turning to the Lord? That's how. It's the only true answer. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Well, how do we honor the Lord from this passage? Let's actually read Deuteronomy, and we'll see it you, that you, with the first of your produce, but let's read Deuteronomy 8, 11 through 14, and verses 17 and 18. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes which I am commanding you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied, when you have built good houses and lived in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and gold multiply, and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud of you, will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Verse 17. Otherwise you may say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth. That's where it all comes from. That he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Things haven't changed since then. A whole, what? 3,500 years later, roughly, unless we are sinning to make our wealth during those earning years, because you can make wealth in, in scrupulous, unscrupulous ways, we must always remember that our prosperity comes from God. And if there's anything else, it's coming from the other guy. So God willing, after all those earning years, you have a surplus. Now, this is the time when we need to look at our personal finances and what you need to live for those expected remaining years. Proverbs 27, verses 23 to 20 through 27 says, Know well the condition of your flocks, and pay attention to your herds, for riches are not forever, nor does the crown endure to all generations. When the grass disappears, new growth is seen. And the herbs of the mountains are gathered in. The lambs will be for your clothing. And the goats will bring the price of a field. And there will be goats milk enough for your food. For the food of your household and sustenance for your maidens. Now, this is from a long time ago when things were different than our current economic situation. But I have to ask, how are your flocks? Does your household have enough sustenance? In other words, what's your portfolio look, look like? What are your investments? What have you, through God, amassed for yourself, but not really for yourself even? So financial planning during those earning years is crucial, whether it's a 401k, an IRA, money market account, maybe you invest in real estate. There should be some type of investment strategy to ensure your personal needs are taken care of. Plus also, all these things need to be done prayerfully because I don't know how many times God has impressed it on my heart to do something and I haven't and I could kick myself later for it. Because God knows what he's doing. So, but you think of this. Take care of myself personally, right? 
Well, it sounds kind of selfish at first, doesn't it? It's about me. I got to make sure I'm okay. But let me ask you this. As we said earlier, how can you take care of someone or something else if you're not taking care of first? Have you ever been on the airplane? And they give you the little scenario, and they say if the oxygen mask drops, to put it on yours on first and then assist someone else, because if you don't, you might not be able to assist anyone. And it's the same kind of motif. Also making sure that you have sufficient means for your life that means that you won't make bad decisions later because of financial distress. And that can take you down a wrong path or a wrong decision very easily into a very ugly place. So keeping that in mind, we also want to make sure that your assets that God has given you during those earning years go where you, as a faithful steward of God, direct them. So in today's lesson, begin with personal needs also means having your house in order. Second Kings verse 20, or chapter 20, verse 1 says, In those days Hezekiah became mortally ill, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. So what does that mean to set your house in order? We hear this in the Bible many times. Finalizing those details ahead of time in case you can't for some reason later, making sure that any illness that might happen that prevents you from making the right decisions happens. Putting your house in order is deciding where everything goes, who gets what, and making sure that it's all done so there are no family squabbles, so there are no court cases or any of those ugly things that can happen. And even though they still might in today's world, at least you help when your house is in order eliminate a lot of that. And also, not only how much goes to your family, but which ministries get what. So it sounds good, right? So let me ask you, there's, there's a flip side to all of this. Say you and your spouse get into an accident and die. You don't have any children or anything like that. What happens then? And you have not, you know, made a will. You have not put your affairs in order. Well, most states of the government take a look at your close blood relatives. If they find a person or persons, then usually, as you said earlier, Barbara, there's a fee associated with it, but those assets will be passed along to them, and they can do what they please with it. So that could be donating it to charity or an unspeakable weekend in Vegas. And everything in between, your money is no longer you have no say in it. So the possibilities are endless on how that could happen, right? Because you lost all control because you didn't plan better. So let's flip it around here then. Let's say that you have no close relatives, living blood relatives. The state will probably take it all. And you don't even know what they're going to do with it. But for me, I think the government has enough of my money already, or really God's money. So if you're not financially responsible with what God has given you, do you think you're accountable for what happens to it in the end? God did give it to you, right? So we want to be prepared. We want to have everything in line, our affairs taken care of, our house in order, because God expects that of us. Otherwise, we would be bad stewards. As for me... You know, I don't want my last act with God in case something like that happens. I don't want to have it to where it's left to the world to decide. So for me, it's one of those things where I want to make sure it goes to where God really needs it to go. Proverbs 22.1 says, A good name is to be more desired than great wealth. And we read this earlier, but favor is better than silver and gold. It's that good name. Because if God looks at you and says, you know, welcome, good and faithful servant, isn't that what we want to hear? That's the only good name that matters. So let that good name be to the glory of God, especially in our returning years. It is worth more than anything this earth can offer.
Elisa, can you tell us about Wednesday's lesson, Deathbed Charity? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so <clears throat> Wednesday's lesson deals with how we use and justify the use of whatever material blessings we have during our lifetime and in the legacy we leave behind with others and specifically on a focus of, you know, did how, how did you use it during your lifetime and then where does it go in the end? But did you kind of ignore the good things you could have done during a lifetime and then, you know, in the last moments of, of your life, you're trying to make these decisions? That, that's really not a prudent use either. So this is what the, this day's lesson is, is focusing on. Let's start with a couple of Bible passages um, that counsel us on this topic. Let's go to 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. And we read there, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So <clears throat> this text reminds us not to trust in uncertain riches, but instead be rich toward God who gives us all things. In fact, Paul begins this passage as a declarative statement using the Greek word parangelo, which is to charge, to command, or to order. It's the same word used in Luke 8.29. That's when Jesus commanded the unclean spirits to come out of the man. So this is a matter we are to take seriously. It has eternal consequences. The text goes on to say that we are to live a life rich in good works towards others. Be willing to share and to give to others as we are able and called to do. Our mind should be on the eternal life ahead, and by living today for the eternal life instead of this present one, we are storing up a good foundation for that time to come. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, it reads, While we do not look at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So this text is again counseling us to place our focus and affections on things that are eternal rather than on the material things of this present age. And in Proverbs 38 and 9, we read, Remove falsehood and lies from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food allotted to me, lest I be fool and deny you, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and still and profane the name of God. In this passage, the author recognizes that there may be a snare in both having too much and having too little. Our prayer should be that we ask the Lord for his wisdom to give us what we need and what he determines should be allotted to us. In Ecclesiastes 5.10, we read, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance, this is also vanity. So there is a danger in having an abundance. We may fall in the trap of enough is never enough. Ellen White in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, writes, I saw that many withhold from the cause while they live, quieting their conscience that they will be charitable at death. They hardly dare exercise faith and trust in God to give anything while living. But this deathbed charity is not what Christ requires of his followers. It cannot excuse the selfishness of living. Those who hold fast their property till the last moment and then surrender it to death rather than to the cause. Losses are occurring continually. Banks fail. The property is consumed in very many ways. Many propose to do something, but they delay the matter, and Satan works to prevent the means from coming into the treasury at all. 
It is lost before it is returned to God, and Satan exalts that it is so. Furthermore, in Councils on Stewardship, she writes, Dying legacies are a miserable substitute for living benevolence. The servants of God should be making their wills every day in good works and liberal offerings to God. So really, it comes down to be a trust matter. You know, the, the Lord said, don't worry about the things that you need, the food you, the, you eat, the, what you're going to wear, the clothes, that, you know, that he cares for all those things as he, you know, had, has adorned the fields with flowers so he will care for us. And as he's taken care of the birds, so he will care for us. And so, you know, holding back from doing the good that God is prompting to you and delaying it because you're afraid that you won't have enough in the end is, is not a prudent way to live. Uh, the Lord will care for his people and sustain them, um, and we are to do his bidding. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll conclude here and say that all the blessings received during our lifetime should be faithfully used to glorify God. King David, we spoke of earlier, he's a good example of someone who had an abundance, but yet he was rich toward God. His life's mission was to build a house for the Lord. And while it wasn't his place to build the temple, throughout his lifetime, he gathered together the materials and resources necessary for the building. He was then able to pass that on to Solomon, his son, both a material and spiritual legacy to continue the work that God had given him. So, um, Barbara, maybe um, you could tell us more about this spiritual legacy. What is that? The spiritual legacy. Yeah. So, it's interesting to think about what the earth would have been like had man not sinned. But it would be very different. There wouldn't be poverty. There wouldn't be the hoarding. There wouldn't be the, the greed. And it would just have been a very different way of living. And we look forward to that one day in heaven. So let's take a look at a few scriptures here about what goes about <clears throat> us living in this fallen world. So Psalms 24 1 says, the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. So the, the, wor the, the earth does belong to the Lord, everything that's in it, and it's amazing how he maintains this earth. Hebrews 3, 4 says, For every house is built by someone, but he who has built all things is God. And we see that again in his, all we have to do is take a walk out in nature. Psalms 50, 10 says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. Genesis, And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, God of the most high possessor of heaven and earth. And then in Colossians 1, 15 through 17, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or power, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and all things consist and of him all things consist so <clears throat> everything is god's god is the one who provides us the opportunities to be wealthy to uh, trust him to live in poverty he gives us exactly what we need uh, for our lives and he makes us then steward, stewards and manages, managers of what he has entrusted to us. And the strength to have, to have anything, or the strength to have anything at all. It's only logical then that when we are finished with what God has given us and have taken care of our family, we should return the rest to him. Ellen White in Councils on Stewardship says, In giving to the work of God, you are laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. All that you lay up above is secure from disaster and loss and is increasing in, to an eternal and enduring substance. 
and will be registered to your account in the kingdom. <clears throat> so we look at, and we've talked about, how, what we need to do when we, we die to have our will and to have our legacy uh, for our family through our will. But let's think about some advantages we have now. And our, our um, lesson does a nice job of this. So right now, as donors, we can actually see the results of our gift. So if we give now, we can see what our gift is going for. It could be something physical, like a new building. Many people have bought new buildings. It could be um, sending, helping a young person through college. Oftentimes, um, and our, our church is very good about that, actually helping our kids get through school. It can fund an evangelistic campaign, and that just the, the, the many things that it could do can go on and on and on. So um, the, the, uh, the ministry or person can benefit now when it's the most needed. That's why we have things like member emergency funds to help out different members who are struggling. We have the homeless ministry, and many in the homeless ministry are helped by uh, gifts that are given uh, to our church. The other thing that um, we, we see here is that there's no fighting among family or friends after you're gone because it's all, you've already given it away. They can grumble at you, but it doesn't do a lot of good if you're not around to grumble at. So it reduces that, that struggle within, within the family. It sets a good example of family values and generosity and love for others. And that's always something that we want to leave to our children is that, that opportunity for love and generosity because that is really the key foundational part of being a, a child of God. It minimizes your tax consequences. It guarantees that the gift you, you made will go to its desired entity. There's no interference from the courts or relatives. And it demonstrates that the heart of the donor has been changed from selfish to unselfish. But last and more important, it stores up treasure in heaven. And so we see that from <clears throat> the financial perspective, but I want to just talk for a, a minute about the, our time and the legacy that we give from our time. M many times... The, those hours that we spend giving Bible studies, mentoring someone, uh, a child, teaching, uh, teaching a group of people about God, all of these things that we have the opportunity to do, go on a mission trip. There's so many things that we can do with our resources and our time that will really benefit others. And these are, the, these are the things that really lay up treasure in heaven. There's so much joy when we, bring, when we see someone come to the Lord, when we have baptisms, there's so much joy in it. And to be part of that is a blessing that every one of us should be able to share in. So I also wanna bring a supplemental note from, from Ellen White here, uh, from Testimonies to the Church. Many are making a great mistake in regard to the things of life. They economize, withhold, thing from themselves and others the good that might receive from right use, the means of which God has lent them, and become selfish and avarice. They neglect the spiritual interests and become dwarfs in religious growth. For all the sake of accumulating wealth, which they cannot use. They leave their property to their children, and nine times out of ten, it is even a greater curse to their heirs than it has been to themselves. Children rely upon the property of their parents, often fail to make success in this life, and generally utterly fail to secure the life to come. The very best legacy which parents can leave their children 
is a knowledge of useful labor and example of a life characterized by disinterested benevolence. By such a life, they show the true value of money, that it is only to be appreciated for the good it will accomplish in relieving their own wants and necessities of others and in advancing the cause of God. Thank you, Barbara. Wow, did you enjoy this week's lesson? <clears throat> One final thought, and this is partially from um, Friday's lesson and the, and the Sabbath School Quarterly. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4. This is pages 480 through 481. Those who neglect known duty by not answering to God's claims upon them in this life and who soothe their consciences by calculating on making their bequest at death. In other words, you know God's convicting you, but you're like, oh, I'll give it, I'll give it at, when I die. We'll receive no words of um, commendation from the master, nor will they receive a reward. They practice no self-denial, but selfishly retain their means as long as they could, yielding it up only when death claimed them. That which many propose to defer until they are about to die, if they were Christians, indeed, they would do while they were, um, have a strong hold on life. They would devote themselves and their property to God, and while acting as his stewards they would have the satisfaction of doing their duty be, by becoming their own executors. They would meet the claims of God themselves instead of shifting, shifting the responsibility upon others. And if you've ever been an executor of a will, you get to hand out all the stuff to people. You can do it yourself, and you can experience that joy as we talked earlier. Um, we should, um, we should regard ourselves as stewards of the Lord's property and God as the supreme proprietor to whom we are to render his own when he shall require it. When he shall come to receive his own with usury, the covetous will see that instead of multiplying the talents entrusted to them, they have brought upon themselves the doom pronounced upon the unprofitable servant. Simply put, Sister White says that you cannot selfishly use your means for yourself in your returning and then give to God whatever's left over when you die, when you really can't use it anymore anyway. So let me ask you this. We may retire from my career in the world, right? When do we stop working for God? Never. When you fall asleep in Christ, that's when you stop working for God. So if we're working for God in those latter years, one would imagine that supporting God's work with your available means would just come naturally, right? As a need arises, as God impresses upon your heart. Whether it is time, as Barbara mentioned, or money, both are valuable. I think time is more valuable than money sometimes. It is that simple. We never stop giving back to God until his breath of life that is in us returns back to him. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, help us, teach us, to come to you in all things, to be good stewards, Lord, to know where the blessings come from as we've covered, Lord, to know that it's really not of our own making and it never was. Lord, you guide us and you bless us so that we can bless others. A blessing that's hoarded to self becomes, Lord, it becomes a disease. It changes the way you look at things, Lord, and it, it becomes a prison to that person. Lord, help us to feel that joy that you feel, Lord, when we share with others, especially in those latter years, Lord, that we might 
know the joy of the Lord that it's better than any feeling we can get from this world. Teach us to remember, Lord, that you want us to take care of ourselves. You want us to help our family, Lord, but you also want us to support your work. I think of Nicodemus when Ellen White wrote about him, Lord, after he'd collected the body of Jesus, and he literally took all that he had to support the church during a time when there was great trial and turmoil, Lord, and using his means, he sustained the church that could have ended a very different way. Lord, you give us means in this world. Especially in Orange County, we are very prosperous many times, Lord. Help us to use those means to do what's right in your eyes. And help us, Lord, to never, ever forget we are the sons and the daughters of the living God to represent you well, Lord, to have that character of Christ and to perfect that character, the only thing we will take to heaven with us, Lord, that we might be with you for all eternity. We thank you and praise your glorious name, our Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, Savior and Lord. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Happy everyone. Sabbath.